Praise the Lord, everyone. It is good to be back with you again tonight in the house of the Lord. We're uh, having just a few little technical difficulties. That's why we're trying to iron a few things out here tonight. But we're glad that you're with us. Let's start in and, and enter into this place with prayer tonight, seeking the Lord and letting him have his way. Praise God. Let's do that right now. Father, we love you again tonight, Jesus. So thankful for another week, Lord God, that you have kept us and you are strong, Lord God, over us tonight, Jesus. Let your word have its way, dear God, and penetrate our very souls tonight in the name of Jesus. We need you, dear God, in this hour. I ask, oh Lord, for your tender mercy, Lord, to just be a part of us tonight in the name of Jesus. Let the glory of God be seen, Lord. We love you and we exalt your name. We ask you, dear Jesus, to bless the word of the Lord to our ears tonight and everything that is spoken. We ask it in the wonderful and precious and glorious name of Jesus. Amen, amen. Praise God. And so tonight we are uh, entering into another uh, study uh, here tonight. It's been another wonderful week. I hope everybody enjoyed the parking lot uh, service that we had Sunday for Mother's Day. Hope everybody enjoyed their time. It was a great message from Sister Urbanic, who did an awesome job. We appreciate her so very much here at Steadfast. And uh, also, of course, uh, Monday night, we had a wonderful uh, time with our men in our men's small group. Tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, please be mindful of uh, the ladies' small group at 6 o'clock and make sure that you have your invitation you are ready to go, praise God, so don't miss out on that. Uh, we are asking you tonight to continue to pray and lift Sister Marlene Crouch up. They had the uh, funeral yesterday for her husband, Harvey, and uh, want you to continue to pray for her, that the Lord will encourage and lift her up and, and strengthen her in this time of loss. Also, uh, continue to lift up the Hernandez family. I haven't heard anything about funeral or it might even already be done, but please uh, uh, be aware that uh, these folks are in, in desperate need. They've lost some loved ones at this time, and so it's extremely important that we just keep them before the Lord and ask God to just touch them. So lift them up if you would and uh, allow the Lord to minister uh, to them. Praise God. There are, uh, of course, others that we have been mentioning, and it was good to see Bill McCafferty here Sunday, uh, but let, let's lift him up as well. He's been dealing with some physical uh, situations in his life, so let's pray the Lord will just touch him. And we miss you all. Praise God. Let's pray for our church. Let's pray for uh, us getting back into the sanctuary uh, where we can be in fellowship one with another and ask God to just touch that. Praise God. So let's go to the Lord again in prayer and ask the Lord to just minister uh, here in the next few minutes as we go to God tonight in prayer for these. Father, we thank you again that you are our strength and our confidence, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, for Sister Marlene, Lord, that you just lift her up in the name of Jesus. Give her your power, your strength, and encouragement. I know, Lord, in this time of loss, you are an ever-present help in the time of our troubles. And I ask you, God, tonight to minister to her in the name of Jesus. We ask, oh, Lord, that you touch the Hernandez family, Charity and Kathy, Lord God, that you would just give them your peace, that the glory of God be seen all around them, I pray, in the mighty name of the Lord. We love you, Jesus. We pray for Bill McCafferty, our church members, Lord Jesus. Give them, Lord God, what you have for them in this hour. I praise you, Lord. I thank you, God, for your goodness and all that you are doing in this hour, Lord Jesus. I pray, God, that you will inspire us and not only inspire us, God, change us tonight, Lord. Let us, Lord God, sink into what you would have us to be doing in this hour. I praise you and I give you honor in everything in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Uh, we want to let you know that 
it is my desire and it will I'm, I'm going to say this by faith that we will have a service in the month of May in our sanctuary. I can't say that it will be this Sunday, obviously, probably a little too soon, but one of the last two Sundays we are going to launch this on the 24th or the 31st, which is Memorial Weekend, but uh, one of those Sundays we are going to be planning to have everybody back in to the house of the Lord and we'll do it in a socially distancing way. We will have people in their pews, of course, but social distance enough so that we feel like we are still safe. If for some reason you're still not uh, in the next two weeks feeling comfortable with that idea, obviously we'll continue to have our live stream messages Facebook, so on and so forth. So I uh, just want to let you know uh, what, our, what our plans are. We are moving to come back in. If they can congregate at Meyer and Target and those other places and have 100 people in their midst, I think we can easily social distance here. I've been waiting on the authorities. They're starting to open up this Friday. A lot of businesses and uh, whatnot as far as getting your hair cut and whatever else, uh, but uh, they are doing some things as far as opening up. So just wanted to let you know that we are planning to have something here in the next couple of weeks, and we will be back in the house of the Lord. So put that down in your mind. Unless something absolutely happens that stops us from doing that, that's the plan. So we are looking forward to one of these Sundays being with you either the 24th or the 31st of this month. So please keep that uh, in your minds. Amen. It was uh, really good to see all of you here. Like I said, Sunday had a wonderful attendance of probably about 50 some people actually that were here. Thank God for that. And uh, we want you to continue to invite people to whatever venue is available, whether it be small group, whether it be uh, parking lot services or entering back into the sanctuary. We need to be about the Father's business. We need to make sure that we are continuing on in ministry and getting stronger. As I've made somewhat of a theme of this, I want you to be stronger going out than when you came in. And that's really my desire as your pastor to make that happen or uh, at least put it out there, praise God, and encourage you to do everything you possibly can to grow and be strong in the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about something that has been on my heart for probably about a week now in uh, scripture references here tonight. I, I want to actually begin in the book of Revelation chapter number three. And while you may be getting that or turning to that, I want to make you also uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, while we are absent from one another, it's still very important that you stay strong in your giving towards the house of the Lord. Uh, please do not uh, you know, slack off in that area because uh, the lights still need to be taken care of, gas, all those good things. Uh, we need to maintain our building. Uh, we are in a situation right now, though, that we really do need uh, for everyone to step up as far as missions. Missions is an area that we are struggling with a little bit right now, so I'd encourage you to do your very best to be faithful in these areas. But tonight in Revelation chapter 3, if many of you even know what we're talking about when I start talking about the book of Revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the revelation of his church in the last day, at least for the very first three chapters, the Lord deals with his body, his church. In Revelation chapter 3, we read about all of the seven churches of Asia Minor. We read about that from the simple fact that 
uh, it begins to tell us their weaknesses, and it also tells us their strengths. And of course, where I would want us tonight to focus in is actually in uh, the last church that is spoken about, because obviously, when we're dealing with the last church, which is the church of Laodicea, we are talking about uh, the attitude and the direction, the mindset of the end time church and the things that we have to uh, deal with when it comes to our attitude as the end time church. I hope by now that many of you, if not all, realize that we are, we have turned that corner and we are going towards the end of this age. We are looking and we are facing, we are a part of what we consider to be the Laodicean church in this last hour. And so in Revelation chapter 3, we're going to get an idea from the words of Jesus about this particular church. He's given uh, strong points and weak points from all of the others, and now he begins to deal with the very last day. And when I say the last day, I'm talking about the church as we see it right now. We are in the last days. The attitude that the Laodicean church had is what we're going to have to deal with as a congregation, as individuals in this latter part of uh, the end of the age or before Jesus Christ comes back. So in Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 15, we start there. And Jesus immediately gets into the crux of the matter with the Laodicean church. He says, I know thy works. I'm not ignorant of your works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. And when we talk about uh, you know, a situation where you're neither cold nor hot, you're indifferent. Uh, things are happening around us that make us indifferent, that make us ineffective. You're not refreshing, cold. How many like to get up and get a nice cold drink of water from time to time. It's something that really does refresh you. Sometimes on a hot day, you can feel that cold water going all the way down, even into your stomach. It just, you know, you've such, such a contrast. So the Lord is saying, you're neither cold, refreshing, nor hot. That hotness, that, that uh, situation that you are good for purification. You're good for uh, being effective in the kingdom of God. So he says this, he says, you're neither cold nor hot. And it was his wish, it's his desire, because the very next line is, I would that thou wert cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So then because thou art Lukewarm. That's what happens when a hot boiling uh, cup of water or bowl of water sits. It becomes eventually used to the atmosphere that it, of the environment in which it's in. So he begins to say, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You know, it's that not refreshing feeling. It's not that uh, good feeling of being either cold or hot. And it's kind of one of those things, you're looking for something to be refreshing. You're looking for something to be effective. And when you get a good gulp of that uh you know, environment or that situation, you realize, ugh, this is not what I'm looking for. You see, this world is not looking for something that blends in. It does not want us to portray, if we profess to know the Lord as our 
Savior and as the one that is able to save them, he, he does not want us to be lukewarm because we do not then stand out. We blend in. The Laodicean church is fighting blending in. Blending in. He said, because you're neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You're, you're not going to be effective in any form because you've allowed your environment to affect you instead of you affecting the environment around you. This is what the Laodicean church is fighting. It is fighting lethargy. It is fighting a ease of normality to the temperature of the world. And here as he continues on in verse 17, because thou sayest, the whole reason why you've become lukewarm is because you've settled for riches. You are rich and increased with goods and you have need of nothing. And thou knowest not. We don't even know. We do not even know when you get into this lukewarm stage, you don't even know your real condition of your life. Why? Because you are blinded, and he makes mention of this. Because you are rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and thou knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You cannot surmise, you cannot understand the environment that you've allowed yourself to get into. This has been my earnest plea to everyone at Steadfast that this is not a time of vacation. You have heard me say this over and over again. It is not a time to just kind of hunker down and allow yourself to adjust yourself to a new environment. This is a time that we need to take to get ourselves in alignment with the Lord, making sure that our environment around us does not affect and bring us to the place of lukewarmness. If we've just simply adjusted in this last hour, we're going to be ineffective for the kingdom. And this is the church. Understand this. This is the church that is supposed to have great end time harvest and revival. How can we have what the Lord has desired for his church to have if we are in lethargy? We have settled down. We've gotten away from our routine of coming to church and We've adjusted, and I hope that many of you have not adjusted away from keeping the church as a priority during this time. If you have, whoa, stop. Understand the direction that you're going. Some of you will actually be viewing this not live, but you'll be viewing it later when it has become convenient. We need to realize this is a time to stay spiritually in tune with the Spirit of God. Stay repentant in your heart. This is a, something else that we have, we have pressed upon you so many times. This is a time to stay repentant before God. Make sure that, that there is nothing that is going to come clouding into your spirit and into your mind, into your heart that would allow you to just take your ease. I wish there were some words tonight that I could actually use to describe how I really feel, but this is a, a, such an incredible and in, a very crucial 
We are at a very strong turning point right now in the kingdom. And the church needs to not just maintain, get back to a norm of what they were before, but this is the time for the church to really move forward in God and to be closer to God in stripping away anything that would keep us from the presence of the Lord, from allowing the, the, the Lord of glory to, to elevate us, amen, and draw closer to him than we've ever been before. So he says to the Laodicean church, he's, he's talking literally to us tonight. He, he really is. There's no other way of looking at this tonight than other, than other than just understanding that this is what we are going to fight. And especially as the Lord has now kind of quarantined us and gotten us away and gotten our attention. You understand the Lord has allowed the world, not just the state, not just the city, he's allowed the world to stop. That does not happen by anyone else but God. He has slowed this pace. He has taken our attention off of lights and smoke. We don't have that kind of thing here in Steadfast. But there's so many others that have grown up and allowed that to take over in their, in their, in their times of worship. And I'm telling you right now, it isn't about all of the effects. It's about your relationship with God. It's about seeking the Lord. It's about realizing that God is pointing us in that final direction towards eternity. And he's saying to the church, church, don't go stale. Don't allow yourself to fall asleep. Understand right now what you really need. Let me continue on because he says after all of these things that you're naked, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind. Why is that? Why is that? Why why are we so why are we feeling rich and increased with goods and we don't have need for anything? It's simply because we've put our hopes and we've put our energy, we've put amen an emphasis in our life when it comes to serving the Lord upon the environment that we're in. The beauty of the building, the the things that we are uh, you know, accustomed to as a norm as far as church. What really gets us going? The fact of the matter is nothing should get you going except the Lord. Where is that relationship? Are you rich without God? Are we rich and increased without relying and trusting and reaching and getting a hold of God. It's an hour that we can't afford to do that. It's an hour where we need to realize that God is trying to point us in the right direction. He says, so I counsel thee, this is verse 18, to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Something that is genuine, something that is real. Notice he says, I, I counsel thee to buy of what? Your pastor? Your church? Too many are waiting to get back to that environment. And there's nothing wrong with being in the presence of the Lord. But when we rely upon church and the environment to, 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 to dictate whether we're cold or hot, we've missed it. We are not doing what we need to do, and that is to maintain our relationship no matter 
what falls apart, where we can't go, what we can't do. We need to realize that our relationship with God has got to maintain and begin to get stronger and as we fall away from things. As the Lord has stripped us from things, we should have reached to him and said, Lord, but you are the reason why I live. In you I move and breathe and have my being, as the scripture says. He says, so I want you to counsel of, of, to buy of me. Don't look anywhere else. Buy of me gold that is tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. You want to be rich? Be rich on what God can offer and what he brings into your life because you're hungry after it. You're not complacent. You're not falling asleep, but you are hungry after God at this time. And he is fulfilling. He is making you rich. You are becoming richer, not poorer, because we've been quarantined away from what we have denoted as to be church and God. This building is not God. These people are not God. There's only one that you need to lean on and his name is Jesus, especially at this time. He says, buy me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment. Why the white raiment? Something that has been purified by the Lord because of our nakedness. That thou mayest be clothed and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Why? Because when individuals get in this state, they fall away from what is real. Everything that meant God to them has been taken away. And all of a sudden they fall and shrink and diminish in the quarantine scenario. And their relationship has died off and you've gotten lukewarm and, and you've fallen away from your real relationship with Jesus Christ. It is in that time that we need to open, have our eyes open and realize where we're at. He goes on and he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Stay close to me. Behold, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. There's that fellowship. There's the fellowship. He's knocking at the door. But if we're naked and poor and blind and we do not see what we need, we will, we will not be able to hear the knocking on the door. He goes on and he says, to him that overcometh. In other words, your hope is not built on church alone and the people of God, but you have got a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ that sustains you, that lifts you, that continues to work in your spirit and in your life, no matter what your environment is doing. To him that overcometh, I will grant to sit with me in, in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. He is ministering to us tonight from the church of Laodicea. It is a church that had some major issues when it came to the Lord, when it came to their walk with God because they put so much emphasis upon their world and they started blending in and they didn't keep Jesus Christ number one and first in their, in their relationship. And so that's what brought them to this lukewarmness, their ineffectiveness. This is not an hour that the church is supposed to be ineffective. 
This is the hour in the end of the age before the rapture of the church when the church really needs that the, to be at the very best at the height, allowing the gifts of the Spirit to flow through us because I believe so strongly that in these last days the Lord is going to do miraculous miracle power and the workings of Almighty God amongst us, but he's not going to allow his glory to be shared with anyone. It's all going to have to be done with the right mindset. We can't have a lukewarm attitude and a lethargic pseudo walk with God. This is the time to fire up. This is the time, praise God, to be, amen, as a cold fire, amen, to be complete in this last hour. In the Gospels, the Lord actually speaks of the harvest. He does this three times, actually, in the scriptures. In John chapter four, in Luke chapter 10, and also Matthew chapter nine, the Lord speaks about his harvest. I'm gonna start at John chapter four and verse 34 because this is an example of what Jesus was talking about when he came out of a encounter with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well. And at the end of that encounter, when she realized who she was talking to, she ran back to the town and became the very first evangelist to her town. You see, when you have the Lord interacting with you, it makes you want to go tell somebody. Laodicea had a problem. They were not interacting with the Lord as they should. And so they became environmentally blended instead of being effective. This is a woman that did not want to talk to anybody from her town. But when the Lord got done showing, him, showing her who he was and how awesome he was, she, she didn't care about anybody. She wanted to spread the news. That's the way the church needs to be in this last day. When we have that encounter with the power and the presence of the Lord, we have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God and he begins to show us how great he's going to be in our lives. It will send you to the sinners, to those of, that are lost. And you'll say, come see a man Come see a man that's told me everything that has changed my life. And with great passion, you will go out and begin to spread the gospel to the harvest. And Jesus coming out of this example here in John chapter four, his disciples come to him because they had not been with him all day. And they said to him, Jesus, do you want something to eat? And he said to them, you don't understand. My meat is to do the will of the Father that sent me. I have meat, I've been feasting all day on the meat of heaven. He starts in verse 34 of John 3 and he says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And then he cautions. He brings a caution. And he says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. You know, this is a deception that I believe even Laodicea was under. It's a deception that we've got to fight as the end time church. I've got time. I've got time. I, I wish somehow, some way, this camera tonight could just like kind of zoom. I don't, I don't want you to do that, but I wish you would zoom right on my face so you can hear what I'm saying here tonight. We are out. As the church of the living God, we are out of time. We are out of time. Jesus warned 
the church. Jesus warned the saints that we're going to go into the harvest. He said, I don't want to hear you speak. Oh, I've got time. Don't say you've got four months and then, you know, I'll get to it. That is, that is the worst direction that we could be a part of tonight is thinking, well, you know, eventually when things calm down in my world and all that I'm dealing with and all that I'm going through and all that I'm doing right now for myself, for my life, then I'll do something for God. We are out of time. We do not have much time left. He said, don't say there's four months and then come of harvest. He said, I want you to really see. And this is the problem that Laodicea had. It got into a lukewarm stage and it got into a situation where they became blind. And that's exactly where many apostolic Pentecostals are today in this end time surge in the last hour. They are blind to the hour in which they're living in. Oh, they can see things going on, but it does not shake them towards passion to talk to the Lord and get themselves right so that the message of the gospel can go forward. He says, lift up your eyes. This is the hour right now to lift up your eyes and look on the fields. There's nothing wrong with the fields for they are white. Nothing wrong with the fields. It's harvest time. It is harvest time. They are white all ready to harvest. We are out of time of excuse. We don't have the luxury of saying, I'm going to get it done someday. If anything else has become your God in this time of adjustment, you need to repent. I'm just going to say it tonight. We're out of time and there's got to be some repenting. Jesus also said in Luke chapter 10 in verse number two, the, the harvest truly is great. This is how he viewed the harvest in the end time. But the laborers are few. There's nothing wrong with the harvest. It's the laborers, he said, that are few. And here's the solution. To the end time Laodicean church who is wretched and poor and blind, who need to buy of him gold tried in the fire, who need to put on white raiment, purify yourselves, repent, turn away from those things that are causing you to be rich out there. Everything is taking occupation in my life and I'm not giving the time that is needed to Jesus. He says, here's the solution. Pray ye. Pray. Here's what you need to pray. That the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into his harvest. Guess what? That doesn't excuse us. That obligates us. He's saying, if the harvest is going to be reaped, I need people that know how to pray. I need people that will get on their face before me and pray, and pray, and pray. And not only pray, but to ask for more laborers to go into the field. That's what we're building here at Steadfast Church. Moving from this day forward, amen, into what God is leading us into in the end time that we've run out of time. We are building a place where people are going to neither be serious 
or they're going to fall away into lukewarmness. We need people that are going to be serious and know how to pray and say, Lord, amen, wake me up. I've run out of time. If you want to see your family saved, this needs to be the drive of your soul that you learn to pray and seek God for their salvation because you are obligated to do this. He is calling for laborers, prayer warriors. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, actually, I'm going to skip to verse 37. He says, the harvest truly is plenteous. Again, he confirms there's nothing wrong with the harvest, but the laborers are few. And again, he reiterates in this gospel as he did in Luke chapter 10. The solution is prayer. Prayer to God that, Lord, you will send laborers into your harvest. Laborers that delight and love you and desire to reach for the lost. Because the only way Hear me, the only way that they are going to be saved if somebody gets serious about praying for them. Somebody falls on their face before God and says, enough is enough. If it's going to get done, I've got to earnestly contend. I've got to earnestly seek I've got to earnestly pursue after what the Lord has called me into and that is a life of prayer and dedication unto God. There's nothing wrong with the harvest. It's the laodicea in church. It's the attitude that permeates the air throughout our organization, throughout the world. I believe in social things, but folks, if it has no spiritual element to it, God help us. God help us. I'm going to ask us to pray tonight. And I'm asking you to pray from the simple fact that Where's my responsibility? Am I going to be one of the laborers in the end time harvest? Lord, use me. Lord, use me. Forgive me, God, for focusing in upon what I want, what I've got to have what I've got to do. And let my focus be upon you because there's literally no time left to get done what God wants to do in this last day. And it's going to take a lot of prayer. It is going to take people that are dedicated to prayer, lifting up the name of Jesus seeking the face of the Lord and calling those things that are not as if they were already. So tonight as we pray in closing, I'm asking you to consider where you may be right now. Are you so wrapped up in your world that you've forgotten his? You know, we can give God a little bit of time sometimes in prayer. We can give God a little bit of time, you know, during our week. But where do we put most of the time? For the kingdom. Is it in little small 15-minute segments? Has the Lord diminished? I want to be a laborer in this final harvest. And I pray you do too as well.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, tonight, oh God, God help us. Lord, if there's anything that we need, it's more of you, not less of you. God, touch our focus. Lord, let our focus not be upon me, my stuff, what I've got going on, what I need to accomplish and what I need to get done. But God, where is it, Lord God, in my life? Jesus, for the kingdom's sake, Lord, touch me, anoint my mind tonight. Take off, oh God, the scales from my eyes that I might see, Lord Jesus. The most important thing is not what I've got going on, God, but what you have me focused in upon and what you desire from me. Jesus, have your way. Lord, we need your help. We've got to have your help, Lord. As we come back in, Lord Jesus, to this sanctuary in the next couple of weeks, I pray, God, that you will just, Lord God, put a hunger so deep in our soul that we will come into this house not looking for a goose bump, but God having, oh God, a hunger so deep that the presence of God will take over in every service that any sinner, Lord God, will feel your power and your glory. They will feel the anointing of God. They too, Lord Jesus, will come to know you in all of your power and your glory. Jesus and Lord God, as we go in through our day, Lord, make us God conscious. Make us conscious, oh God, of the kingdom and the things of the kingdom, I pray. Lord, set us, set us, dear God, where you desire us to be. Set us, oh God, where you desire us to operate, dear God, in these last few minutes of time before the rapture of the church. I pray, God, that you will touch us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you tonight. Praise God. You know, you may say to yourself, well, pastor, is it really that important? Is it really that serious? Does it really have? Yes, it does. It really does. It makes that much difference. Because if you're simply just looking out for yourself, you missed why you've been filled with his power and washed in his blood. If you're fulfilling the things that, uh, your plans, putting that first, you're falling into iniquity and you're falling away from God and not closer to God. I've taught about iniquity for so many years now. I pray that you understand that it is doing what you want to do and forgetting the source of your strength and power. It's important in this last day to be right with God to be where he wants us to be. I don't want to be lost. I don't want to see you lost. I don't want to see you lukewarm. God bless you. Amen. We'll see you Sunday right back here, worshiping and praising and magnifying the name of the Lord. God bless you. Praise God.